my name is Vitaly Wool, and uh, I work for Consulco Group, and I'll give a short talk about ZRAM and decoupling it from a specific backend that it uses. Um, a few words about myself. Uh, I've been using and promoting Linux since 1998, and I've been doing embedded Linux since 2003, uh, back in the days when Mona Vista was big, I was working for Mona Vista in Moscow, Russia, as a part of, of the uh, dedicated development team. Um, moved to Sweden in 2009. There is a person in this room who knows part of the story. <laughs> yeah, so I moved to Sweden, to southern Sweden, Lund, in 2009 and uh, was working mostly as a consultant since then, mostly for then Sony Ericsson and after Sony Mobile, uh, doing stuff primarily, again, in the kernel area. And now um, I'm a staff engineer at Consulco Group and managing director of the small Consulco entity in Sweden called Consulco AB, uh, and still doing consultancy work but on behalf of Consulco. Um, yeah, and um, yeah. love travel, I uh, have kind of a big family, and yeah. Um, that's basically um, what I wanted to say about myself as a short introduction. Um, another introductory slide is about this presentation. Uh, this is a bit of an outline. We're going to talk about um, swapping as such and what ZRAM is and what ZSwap is. If, um, if you know everything about it, just let me know. We'll skip, we'll jump over these slides. But still, to be complete with the uh, story, I prefer to have these slides and talk a little bit about those. Uh, but if this is not necessary, just let me know. We're flexible. <coughs> It's better to have more time for questions. So swapping as such and what ZRAM is and what ZSwap is. Um, swapping backends, what we mean by that. Uh, we'll talk about ZRAM over ZPool um, uh, and perspective of this approach. We'll do some comparisons and we'll jump to conclusions. Nothing really outstanding, but here we go. Um, ZRAM and ZSwap. To talk about ZRAM and ZSwap, let's uh, agree in terminology, and basically uh, we're talking about swapping and compression. Uh, swapping also uh, is called paging sometimes, and that's because uh, it's all about pushing the pages that are not used uh, to a storage that has a lot of space but it's probably uh, a little less or a lot less uh, uh, perform a lot less uh, <clears throat> sorry good performance wise uh, than the RAM uh, so we basically push pages out of RAM to a secondary storage which is usually a hard drive or a flash device and uh, by doing that we sort of trade memory for performance uh, because if we want to uh, retrieve the pages that are eventually swapped, we will have to spend some time doing that, you know, to read the pages back. Um, there is a certain idea on how we can optimize that, and that is basically cache pages before actually writing them to a storage. Um, and that is a pretty straightforward idea, but if we do that, uh, we will lose uh, the memory win if we do it in the straightforward way. So we have to do it in a non-straightforward way, and that calls for a compression. So we're going to keep the pages compressed, uh, and that will probably still be better if we eventually need them, because uncompressing pages uh, with modern CPUs will take less time than uh, pulling them from a storage device. Uh, and the first thing, the first um, approach uh, that has been implemented um, 
was ZSwap, uh, which is actually a front swap implementation. So there's a front swap API, which provides a sort of transcendent memory interface for swap pages. Uh, so it intercepts pages to be swapped and processes them in any way it wants. And ZSwap processes them in a very simple way. It compresses them and puts them into a certain uh, pre-allocated area. So in a sense, ZSwap is a compressed write write-back cache. Uh, and when the pool, pool of pages is full enough, it pushes compressed pages to the secondary storage. Uh, and then pages are read back directly from the storage. It's important to mention that ZSwap is not self-sufficient in the sense that it cannot really function without the backing device. It's just a caching thing. So it mostly targets desktop and server systems uh, where you have a secondary storage for the real swap, but still want to optimize that somehow. ZRAM um, came in a little later and uh, it's similar to ZSwap in one sense and quite different in the other. Uh, because it implements a uh, block device uh, which is standalone uh, with on the fly compression and decompression. So it's basically a RAM disk but with on the fly compression and decompression. And it came in as an alternative to ZSwap uh, primarily for embedded devices uh, because once again for embedded devices, uh, secondary storage is either limited or can be used uh, for swapping for other reasons. Just for example, uh, we might be afraid of wearing out a flash because it's just not replaceable on a normal embedded system. So we don't want to swap to uh, a flash which is uh, directly wired. Mm, and we still want to have some kind of a swap device. So then we have ZRAM, uh, which swaps to RAM and also has a compression. So um, once again, as a terminology thing, um, we would like to address ZRAM and ZSwap as front ends because they both process swapped out pages and store them compressed in RAM. So we would like to agree that we call them uh, compressed uh, data front ends. And they both need a back end which actually handles storing compressed pages. Uh, in other words, a compressed page allocator. And here we go to the backends that we currently have in the kernel. And the first backend historically is called ZBUD. And um, that one is really simple. It stores up to two objects per page. Uh, one object being bound to the beginning and the other being bound to the end. It deals with uh, objects by rounding their size to chunks. Uh, and then it organizes uh, unbudded lists. And that means uh, for all the objects that only have one body, uh, we add them to a corresponding list LN, as you can see on the picture, where LN is a list of all unbodied objects with exactly N free chunks. So if we want to uh, store an object that requires N free chunks, we take the first uh, entry off of the LN list. Well, if it's empty, we take the first entry off of LN plus one and so forth. So this is very simple, um, very deterministic. It has some drawbacks, but we'll talk about it later. Um, after that came in 
another allocator called ZS malloc, which was from the very beginning uh, a part of ZRAM, and then it was uh, transformed into a self-sufficient thing uh, with its own API. And it works in quite a bit of a different way. Um, it allocates ZS pages, so-called ZS pages first, which uh, every ZS page is uh, basically consisting of uh, a power of two physical pages that are not contiguous, but are mapped into a contiguous space. So they form ZS page uh, as shown on the picture. And then uh, compressed objects placed contiguously within the ZS page. Uh, well, as shown on the picture again. And uh, this is, of course, uh, a lot better approach when it comes to density of the objects because uh, you can see that there are no free spaces uh, within the ZS page. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, as the time goes, uh, fragmentation issues may occur because uh, as you can see uh, on the rightmost uh, picture, uh, if you free an object somewhere uh, in the middle of a ZS page, uh, then there is a certain hole that uh, can then be fulfilled uh, by storing another object. But if it's not exactly the space uh, of the hole, then there can be some uh, free space left. Uh, so we end up having to deal with fragmentation. And ZS malloc currently does implement a complex mechanism to deal with that. Uh, but still, we need to uh, understand that uh, fragmentation issues uh, may become tough as the time goes. Question? Yeah, um, these uh, compressed objects, are they always pages? Or no, no. Uh, uh, in ZRAM and, and, and basically um, in ZSwap2, uh, we are uh, swapping out pages. Yeah. So then uh, we are compressing a page into something. Uh, so we can assume that the, compressed, that the result is actually less than a page in size, because otherwise we will just store it uncompressed. So the, the, the compressed object is a compressed page? That's yes. Yeah, yeah. In this context, the compressed object is a compressed page, and we can assume that it's a size of page or less. Um, so if we if we compare and, and or well uh, put together uh, ZS malloc and ZBud applicability um, in a sort of a chart. Uh, we can see that ZS malloc is applicable uh, both to ZSwap and ZRAM, uh, but ZBot is not applicable to ZRAM basically uh, because uh, the goal of ZRAM is to do uh, as much compression as possible, and ZBot uh, is not providing the compression ratio good enough because as we can only place two objects per page, it will never be more than 2x. And in fact, it's going to be uh, even smaller because um, in some circumstances, uh, pages may not compress that well. And there may be a lot of pages slightly more than half of a page size. And in that situation, you will end up basically with one object per page. Um, so, um, and then, then came the idea, uh, why not modify ZBud uh, to hold three objects per page? Because it is still simple in the sense that there are not many corner cases to deal with, uh, but it's a lot more flexible because it's not exposed uh, that much to the situation where you have a lot of pages 
that do not compress well. So um, that threefold um, has been implemented comparably recently. The work started after Embedded Linux Conference 2016. Uh, it's been accepted by mainline in 4.8. And um, from the very beginning, it was just basically uh, a ZBot improvement that happened to be uh, a separate backend. Uh, but eventually, uh, it became ZDRAM ready. And uh, then came the idea, why not use it for ZDRAM if possible? So, sorry, why is that threefold? It is actually a good fit for ZSwap because it supports reclaiming a page uh, like ZBud, as opposed to ZS malloc, which doesn't. It provides better compression than ZBud because it can store three pages instead of two. Uh, and in its current state, it scales well to multi-core system because of uh, per CPU lists, per CPU unbudded lists, uh, as opposed to ZBud, uh, which doesn't use that. Uh, and at the same time, it's actually uh, good enough um, match for ZRAM because of its low latency operation and reasonable compression ratio and uh, good behavior on big little systems uh, which comprise a lot of the embedded systems nowadays and ZRAM is mostly for the embedded so uh, Z3Fold is still okay for ZRAM even though it initially targeted ZSwap. And if we look at that um, from yeah, a chart perspective, uh, it will look like this. So um, Z3Fold uh, retains relative simplicity uh, while having reasonable compression ratio, reclaim support, uh, and therefore it's okay for that swap. Uh, with that said, it also has low latency operation and good scalability, and therefore it's okay for that RAM. Uh, in theory, but in practice, that RAM would not allow any other backend that, than ZS malloc, but we'll get to this. Uh, another important thing to mention is that as we move forward, there may be some new backends coming in. For instance, if we uh, have a hardware compression module that can decompress and compress pages on the fly, uh, like shown on, on the picture, if we have an uncompressed page that is on the fly transferred to a compressed page and stored the same place, basically, uh, then we obviously will have an unused reminder, remainder that we would like to use for something and using that for a page that is being swapped out uh, is a pretty reasonable application in my opinion. Uh, so that calls for a backend that uses this hardware compressor to compress the swapped out page and put it in the reminder of the page that is otherwise looks already full for the system. So this doesn't seem to be a very complicated implementation. Uh, and it seems to be a pretty good match for ZRAM because we uh, would have uh, a block device using unused page end ends. Uh, but once again, at this point, it's not possible because ZRAM is using ZS malloc directly. Um, short summary, we have two compression front ends, ZS malloc, but, sorry, uh, ZSwap and, and ZRAM, and at least three back ends, and maybe more, and that calls for unification and independence. 
and well-defined APIs. Um, also, uh, as different compression backends have different things in focus, and you may have different goals, uh, depending on those goals, you may need some unexpected backend for your ZRAM or ZSwap application. And also, uh, it's beneficial for the kernel ecosystem to have simple means to switch between backends for both ZRAM and ZSwap. Um, yeah, how does it match the current situation? Oh yeah, how? Well, currently it doesn't match very well because uh, ZS malloc can be used by both ZSwap and ZRAM, but two other backends can be only used by ZSwap because ZSwap uses the unified ZPool API and ZRAM doesn't. And that may become a um, certain obstacle uh, to using ZRAM uh, in certain conditions. So why don't we consider using ZRAM over ZPool? Uh, but before that, short slide about ZPool as such. ZPool is basically an abstract API for compressed allocators or uh, backends. It is mostly passed through uh, just invoking callbacks of ZPool clients. Uh, ZSwap has already been converted to use ZPool quite a while ago. And ZPool API is already implemented uh, by all three uh, backends that are available, ZBus, ZS Malik, and Z3Fold. But ZRAM does not use that pool at the moment, and it is using ZS Malloc API directly. Okay, why? Why ZRAM doesn't use that pool? Well, to be honest, I don't know, but I can imagine the following reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, there was no need uh, because as we mentioned, ZBUD isn't really a very good match for ZRAM. So before uh, Z3Fold came in, um, there wasn't a real need for ZRAM to use something else than ZS malloc. Um, another possible reason is that we don't want to introduce a level of indirection. We want to use a certain API directly rather than uh, using something in between. And um, another possible reason, out of my guessworking, is that ZPool API does not exactly match the Smalloc API. We'll get to this later. Um, why I think these are not important enough to hold us from using uh, ZPool uh, with ZRAM. Well, first of all, I believe now there is a need uh, for ZRAM to be abstracted uh, from a certain backend. Uh, the indirection shouldn't be a huge obstacle because it's almost completely optimized out. It's pretty much a pass-through thing. Uh, ZPool API is not set in stone and can be extended to reflect ZS malloc specific functions, which just then be no callbacks in other cases. Uh, and finally, if there are more backends to come, uh, they will obviously implement the ZPool API, and there may be a need for ZRAM to use those, and it will be ready. Um, we will not go over all the ZPool API, basically. It, it, it's a boring thing. Um, uh, let us just state that a vast majority of ZPool API has been live tested by using ZSwap, ZS malloc, and the other backends. So uh, ZPool API maps very well to ZS malloc API, except for the three function lister. So there are three functions to be added. 
Z full compact, Vietnam compacted, and huge class size. Um, and, and, and the patch is out there. I mean, it's hanging around for a while. Uh, so anyone can look at it. Um, so um, I will not overstate by saying that Zpool API is almost ready to embrace ZRAM. And um, when it is ready, like when the patch is there and integrated, uh, changes to ZRAM implementation uh, to use Zpool instead of ZSMalloc are really trivial. So this is, of course, not the full patch, uh, but I think it gives a good idea of how simple it is to convert from using ZSMalloc API into using ZPool API. Yeah, it is straightforward. Um, and finally, um, it's always nice to see some charts, right? So we'll pass over to the fun part. Um, compression under stress. So if we have a stress load uh, that causes a swap uh, to be used extensively, uh, then we can see that ZS malloc is still a leader in the compression ratio, which is no surprise. But the fluctuations are high. Uh, Z threefold is well below, uh, <coughs> but not that much below as Z bud. And the good thing about Z threefold is that the compression ratio does not differ that much from time to time. So it provides a pretty stable compression ratio over time. And at the same time, uh, if we take uh, random read-write performance comparison, we can see that depending on number of threads, uh, this was measured on a HMP system. Well, basically, it was a Qualcomm platform, 630. Uh, basically, what we can see is that uh, that threefold performance uh, does not degrade much, or almost not at all, uh, depending on the number of threads used to stress the system. So scalability is good. And uh, this might also be uh, an important thing when you choose a backend. Well, maybe not, but still it's good to have this option, right? Conclusions. Well, once again, it's beneficial to have simple means to switch between backends, uh, and that means uh, we should use the common API, uh, and that means that ZRAM better be decoupled from ZSMalloc. Uh, we don't have to seek for this API for too long because there is ZPool API, which is already a good match for ZRAM. Uh, we need to make some extensions to, the, to that, but they're really not drastic, not at all. Uh, and once done with that, it would be nice to have ZRAM uh, use this ZPool API and leave kernel developers and configurators uh, the power of choice on which backend to use. Yeah, I think that's it. Thanks for your attention. Are there any questions? Yeah. Well, when it comes, yeah. The actual compression used, is that pluggable? The, the, the algorithm used to compress the pages? Uh, uh, the, I mean, it's not a concern for this, but uh, do we have pluggability in other parts of this system? So yes, so? yes. Uh, um, since since uh, this is the, the comparison is not the key part, uh, I haven't really specified the system used for testing that well. Uh, but it's a Qualcomm 630, and uh, it's the LZ4HC used for compression and decompression. Yeah. 
but on the same, uh, but but it's it doesn't have to be like that. I mean, you, you can uh, you can use LZO, you can use ZComp, you can use whatever. So, but but it's it's already there. It, there is a an implementation within ZRAM uh, that allows to uh, take whatever compression backend I want that is there and present in the kernel. So yeah, it's it's a bit it's a bit funny because ZRAM is is very free and configurable when it comes to selecting a compression backend, but it's not configurable when it comes to selecting an allocation backend. So have you proposed switching like this and got resistance or? Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's been a while ago. Yes. So um, uh, I guess we might be in a good spot to uh, retrade this. You're going to propose it again? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I had a question, which was, are you proposing being able to do the switch at boot time, at runtime, and if it's at runtime, and there are some portions of memory being compressed using one of the other backends, uh, is it going to be hard to actually do that switch while the system is running? You know, have you thought about how you actually want to make it be switchable? Um, the prototype that we use uh, has a, as a kernel parameter. So within within the ZRAM uh, driver, within the ZRAM driver implementation, uh, there is a new uh, module parameter which can also be specified within the kernel command line. Uh, so, so that's boot time. Yes. Is that, have you thought about whether you want to do anything more than that, or is boot time, you think, the right level of uh, configurability? Um, this is sufficient for us, uh, especially given that we can actually compile it as a module and remove the module and uh, insert the module with a different parameter. Um, we haven't really thought about switching at runtime because we didn't feel the need to. I guess it should be possible, but um, we basically just haven't thought seriously about it. Sure. Any other questions or comments? All right, if not, let's thank the speaker. Yep. Thank you.